So, well, thank you very much, Joan. So um, I've been asked to talk about a document that was issued by Public Works, uh, Public Service and Procurement Canada. Um, but what I did as I was listening to presentations this morning and some of the questions I've tried to, you know, add to some of the slides a little bit to address some of these questions. And what I did also was to look at other regulation also in Canada in terms of um, as is related to Legionella and drinking water also. So I want to put a disclaimer up because I did not work on this document. I did not prepare this document. I'm just doing it on behalf of uh, Public Service and Procurement Canada, basically. So in Canada, um, generally speaking, regulations are either under federal jurisdiction or provincial jurisdiction. And we have what we call provinces and territories. So under the federal regulations for Legionella, there's nothing really specific. The only thing we have is uh, the Occupational Health and Safety Code that basically said if there is a, a potential for risk, there's a duty to, uh, to investigate and to remediate. Uh, the National Building Code talks about minimum design, but again, does not address specifically Legionella. And, uh, Anything that's federal, right, federally regulated will be under federal regulations like bang and transportation and so on. And then you have the provincial uh, regulation, and I think that will be the equivalent to the state regulation here. And uh, different provinces and territory varies in their requirements for Legionella, but it's mostly reactive. So if you have an outbreak, you have to do testing and follow up and so on, but there's nothing in terms of preventive per se, except for Quebec. Quebec has a, reg a, a regulation or a règlement for the surveillance of cooling towers, and that is to follow on the very bad outbreak they had in about 2012-2013. And uh, there's also provincial and municipal building code depending on, on where you are. So that's the general gist for regulations in Canada. So I put this on, uh, sorry. So that's the other thing. My slides are really, really packed. And the intent is that I'm gonna talk, you can read much faster than I talk. So I'm just gonna highlight the slides, but uh, you know, the slides deck will be available for you to, to, to review. And the information is there if you want to look at it. So in terms of drinking water, um, we have maximum allowable concentration for microbial chemical and, and, and other things. Uh, and we have guidelines. But for testing for drinking water in buildings, we're only required to test lead, E. coli, total coliform, and sometimes the pH. And as you can see, the Federal Provincial Territory Committee on Drinking Water basically said that there's no need to establish a guideline for chlorine in drinking water. And they suggest that basically it's, you know, you can use it, you can decide on a certain concentration depending on the configuration of the system and, and you know, taking into account uh, aesthetic concerns and things like that. In Ontario, um, we have specific guidelines for special system. And under that guideline, uh, sorry, regulation take that back it's a regulation it's applied to daycare and hospitals so it's it's what it's considered special or high higher risk system basically but again it's not specific to legionella so specifically this document so uh it's referred to as the mechanical directive 15161 originally published in 2013 by uh, PFPC, which is Procurement Service, uh, Public Service and Procurement Services Canada, or in the US, again, as the equivalent to GSA. And it was following the outbreak that they had in Quebec City. So the federal government, feeling a little bit insecure about the whole thing in Quebec City, has published this document afterwards. So just a quick notice what this PFPC, it's a federal department. And it's provide federal employees uh, with um, workspace. So it's managed federal facilities, basically. So it can go from the Parliament of Canada to typical office building for public servants to um, people working on ships and so on. This particular document address um, 
buildings, basically office, mostly office buildings. So the document um, is a standard because it used the language, you shall. And um, there's some recommendations, sometimes that say should, you should be doing this, but most of the time you shall be doing this type of thing. And it's provide a minimum requirement for design, operation, maintenance, and testing for Legionella specifically. And um, the bacterial validation testing focus on total Legionella granophila, and the target audience is property manager, property owners, um, maintenance personnel. So this is important to keep in mind. This is targeting people that manage buildings. At this point in time, this document applies to all Crown-owned um, buildings that are managed by PSPC. And it's mostly office building, and very specifically, it does not apply to remote residential housing. Because of the territories, we wanted to make sure that um, any installation that they have up north, this, this document does not apply to. One of the things I really like from this document is talk about the role and responsibility of different people. And this is just not an exhaustive list, but you can see, okay. So the director general is responsible for monitoring compliance with standards and so on. And there's, you know, its goals and provide training. And then the regional director are responsible for this and the facility managers are respons responsible for different things. So it's very detailed in terms of role and responsibility. And it started with the basic principle, which I really like, and I think that I, you know, as I listen to, to John and so on, I see, um, you know, that other document has been taking into account, like the L8 document and so on. So, but it's say basically, it has to be based on a national building code. It has to be, uh, you know, consistent with the latest industry standard. It has to comply with provincial regulations and so on. And one of the things that I find interesting is that they really want to have consistency throughout the board. So they really want you to use checklists and laws and so on, um, standardized forms so that eventually they can have some sort of database and that would be great if, if everything is consistent in terms of managing this whole thing. And the other thing they talk about is personal, uh, personal protective equipment. So this is not new. I think we have heard about uh, the, the management plan uh, in other documents basically. So what it says is that each facility shall have its own management plan and, uh, you know, with all these conditions and how it's upkeep. And a little bit like the LA document uh, requirement, it is a living document, so you have to keep it updated if there's changes and so on. Uh, as I say, you know, we talk about schematic, about operation manual, about checklists and laws. So the, the the document provides the checklist, basically, and provides the laws. In practice, establishing this plan is not that easy. And um, I can talk about that a little bit later on. But the document itself leaves, you know, to say, well, go and establish a plan with a group of people who may know about the building system. Okay. Uh, so when we do these things, you know, we, we typically like to work with plumber or plumbing engineers because some of these documents say, well, the engineer should be there. Well, I'm a mechanical engineer by trade. I don't know anything about plumbing. So, uh, you know, you need to make sure that it's, it's clearer in terms of who needs to be there. Um, and it's not that obvious to talk about schematic when you cannot find drawings for the building or the la latest drawings date back to 1962 when the building's been built, right? So you don't know what's going on here. So, and, and <laughs> the other thing is, what are the performance indicators um, of these building water systems? A lot of time, uh, they don't know what, how they want these systems to be performed. They just kind of, well, uh, it's, we hired a consultant to come and maintain these units and we hope for the best. I mean, hopefully it's maintained and it does what it's supposed to do. But we don't really know what the, what in-house, they don't know what the key performance indicators are. So, the document talks about the obvious system, uh, you know, the cooling towers, the open water system, 
the HVAC component, the domestic hot and cold water system. But what I know is when we were doing the, the um, establishing the plan, people ask us, well, what about the water coolers? What about the ice machine? What about the eye, emergency eye wash and so on? Do we need to include that in the plan? And if so, what, what are the steps that we need to take to do, basically? So again, you know, I, I have put in some of the slides that talk about the difficulty of doing these plans because it's not always that obvious uh, when you, you try to do an inventory of all the equipment. Uh, one of the things that we've noticed, which is really interesting, and some people will say, well, but I have tenants, so tenants maintain their own equipment, and I maintain the building, so where's the line, right? I mean, and, and uh, sometimes, you know, you have people, different um, age of equipment, have different label, it's been labeled three times, different ways, so you're just trying to figure out how all of this inventory is done uh, can be pretty intensive, basically. Um, and to respond to what Chuck was asking, I'm just gonna show, so there's a risk uh, label that's attached to not only each of the building water system, but to the facility itself. So I'm just gonna show you what it looks like. So for cooling towers, it said that, okay, so if you have a cooling tower that is located less than 10 meters from the air intake, it's considered to be a high risk level. And they go through that for cooling towers, for HVAC system, and for domestic hot water and so on, and there's characteristics that you have to take into account. But even more interesting is that once you've done each of these water systems, the documents say now the facility get labeled. So if, if the facility contains any high risk system, the facility is considered to be a high risk system. Right? So that, that's an interesting difference that I'm seeing with, with other documents. So each of the system, basically for each of the water system in the documents, there's design requirements. If you are building new and are you replacing the equipment, um, there are requirements and consideration that you have to take into account. The section on straight up, shutdown, commissioning of system, uh, operation and maintenance, water treatment, and minimal bacterial testing requirements. Um, in normal operation, in emergency operation, and also uh, they get a little bit specific on the location where to take this test. So this is what it looks like for cooling tower. For operation and maintenance, you have to do an inspection. You know, that's the minimum frequency, how, how, how often you have to clean, how often you have to disinfect and so on. So they get very specific on that. And then um, on the testing. Uh, so it's gotten a little bit better over the years because it's been five years now that the this documents come out and they have tried to implement it. And, but you know, again, how to test, where to test, um, what do you do next, and for how long? And that's still um, there's still a lot of questions about if I get a sort of positive results, you know, what do I do, and who do I report to, and and what does it mean? And um, what is interesting is based on that, they have published a second document talking about communication, and I will talk about that a little bit later on. But you know. One of the documents I really like is a Quebec um, document about sampling protocol, and they explained it very specifically, you know, how to do it and where to do it with pictures, which is always helpful for building operator, basically. So, um, in terms of testing, there's three ways. They want you to do dip slice, they want you to do culture, and they do want you to do qPCR. And I'm gonna go in more detail in each of these. Um, so these are the action levels um, for the different system types. And the, the code is, sorry, I'm just gonna show the code. Oh, where's the code? So the code is green is continue normal operation, yellow is review and adjust, orange is clean, red, well, obviously, you know, it's urgent. <laughs> So, but you can see, I mean, we see the same, the same 
sort of numbers, the, the thousand, the 10,000. What I found interesting is that the level are different for cooling towers and humidifiers, for example. So is how that per, per what? what that's, volume? that's CFU. Per what volume? Um, I don't know what the volume is, but it's probably in the document. But the volume is the, the, the same, right? So relatively, the volume that they take for the cooling tower will be the same for the volume for the drain fan. It's just I'm not sure how they got to that number. What I can tell you is I tried to contact the author of the document, but I haven't heard back. So I don't know if he has to ask permission or he doesn't want to talk to me. <laughs> so um, I asked so where, where these numbers come from, right? And, and it's based on what? But I just want to show you uh, basically um, the, the, what, what they define as action level and not no action level. So this is the testing, the minimum frequency of each of the testing that needs to be done specifically for a cooling tower in terms of this size, in terms of culture, in terms of QPCR. So the PCR was less than 100 G copies per mil? Yeah. And I don't know where these numbers come from, where, you know. So this is the, the code level that I talk about. So I know it's really small, but basically th they have fairly detailed process into what you need to do based on these levels. So based on, for example, uh, I don't know if you see here, weekly testing with the displays, if it's green, you go straight to keep operating and there's no additional testing that's required, but if you are uh, doing weekly testing as in orange, then you need to really clean and then you need to notify people and so on. So it's, a, it's just a good process, basically. So what I did here is I took the, the, the document itself and I did a little bit of comparison with other document that's out there um, and tried to highlight, again, as I say, it's really in tiny writing, but I wanted to cram as much information as I can. And I compare it with the ASHRAE standard 188. And, uh, you know, we know that the MD15161 uh, is a standard, but ASHRAE standard, I think it's, it's not a standard unless it's, um, you know, being um, incorporated in the building code or it's, it's accepted, basically. So it's just referred as a standard, but it's not really a standard until, until then. And what is interesting is that it talk about, uh, the ASHRAE document talk about establishing the, the, the risk assessment, the, the document per se, um, but I don't think it talks much about the, the actual testing. It just say, you know, establish a plan and based on what the team that established the plan say the testing shall be, then go and do the testing basically. So, uh, and there's no um, communication plan basically in the, uh, in the ASHRAE document, though it addressed more system than the MD15161. So this one, uh, the document is a document from the American Industrial Hygienist Association. Again, they, the AIHA document is a guidance document, it's a best practice document. Um, it looks from a public health point of view, and the difference is that they talk about a competent professional when ASHRAE talk about, you know, a team, when the MD15161 talk about a professional engineer. So there's different qualification, if you want, from, from each of these documents. Um, they talk about waterborne and surface sampling in the AHA document. Um, they don't recommend airborne sampling at all. They really would like to focus on viable sampling. And the AIH doc AIHA document focused heavily on the sampling plan and um, the action based on the results. So I looked briefly about um, comparing the document from EPA about different technology for uh, treatment for control of Legionella in premise plumbing. Um, you know, we talk about portable water only as opposed to the MD1561 that talks about cooling tower. You don't really drink water from cooling tower, hopefully. But, um, you know, they talk about the EPA talk about the impact of different technology and how it can be 
used to control Legionella and so on. And uh, so I look at the Canada Occupational Health and Safety Regulation. And it does not talk about Legionella at all, but it talks about the duty to make sure that there's no risk and you have to make sure that you investigate and keep record and so on. So in effect, Legionella could be under that as just considered to be a risk and have to be dealt with. So province and territory, as I was saying, Ontario seems to be aware, most of the provinces and territories, we have done a survey of their uh, public services and they seem to be aware, but they refer to the national building code and the national plumbing code, which we know are minimum requirement and do not address Legionella per se. And, um, you know, they have some sort of statement about Legionella, but not really anything in terms of mandatory design or um, operation and or testing, um, except obviously Quebec and um, Ontario recognized that healthcare um, or facility house are more susceptible uh, installation for Legionella, but they don't have any specific recommendation needed. And this is the Quebec regulation. And I'm sure the, the regulation itself is in French. So um, I, I tried to put a few things on there. One of the interesting thing is that it's required that if you are an owner of a cooling tower, it has to be registered with the um, the building department, basically, and that there have to be a regular maintenance program established and results need to be, testing results need to be sent to um, the, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the building um, regulatory body, basically. And um, they use uh, 10,000 and a million. So above a million, you literally have to notify the health department right immediately and then you know they shut down everything and you retest and everything else. Um, under 10,000 UFC, um, there's nothing, you don't have to do anything. In between the two, you have to do some cleaning and make sure that uh, everything is test again. Um, so I want to go into the highlight of the MD15161. It was um, uh, implemented in about 2013. That's when we start doing um, these um, risk evaluation of these documents, uh, of these buildings. And um, it was done um, for about 360 buildings, basically. And they started monitoring compliance in 2014, making sure that the Legionella control management plan is in place and testing has been done. Um, this is basically information from Jeff that basically said that uh, uh, Jeff Moffat, who is basically from PSPC, and um, what they say is like they, they have increased monitoring and they have basically validation and auditing of compliance in, in their own facility. And um, what they see is that um, other the federal department and other provincial department are starting to adapt the document, the process described in the document also. So um, again, these are results from Jeff Mafat. Um, shows the what you know what the, the, the results that they got um, after they implement the MD15161 in their building. Um, so that's that. So that data um, is. Sorry, let me just go back. Yeah, is the number of culture hits that that um, precipitated then the cleaning. Yeah. So then that's from what I can see, that's only applied to 200 cooling towers. He doesn't have. He doesn't seem to have any data for anything else but the cooling towers, basically. Um, so he sent us to uh, to this uh, link, basically, that's the Public Health Agency of Canada. And what I did was I pulled out the 
number of the percentage of cases since 2014, just to see, you know, if it makes any difference with public works implementing their things or not, basically. And and oops, um, well, in 2015, not really. But uh, what he said was interesting is that he said there's no reported case of legionellosis in PSPC. So the increase is somebody else, basically. So I touched briefly on the communication protocol. Um, after, you know, after the implementation of the MD15161, what they found is that, okay, people get results back and now what? They don't know what to do with it and they create all kinds of misunderstanding and, and so how, who do you communicate and how do you communicate? And so what they did was they create a pretty elaborate chain of communication, basically. And it shows, again, these are the levels where you need to communicate and basically you've seen this. So this is very, I just took um, one of the communication protocol and it say, well, if it's yellow for this slide, you need to, you know, go back to this section. You need to talk to these people. You need to make sure that you adjust the operation and you need to make sure that um, different people are, um, are being notified of what's going on. So as I was saying earlier, implementing the plan is, is sounds easy on paper, but it's not that easy to do on, on the, you know, foot to the ground basis, basically, because a lot of it is left to the building operator. The dip slice testing is left to the building operator because it's too frequent and too costly to have somebody in, a, a third party come in every week to do the, the testing and keeping track of everything, basically. And um, so, so that's where we find that that was one of the weak point of the document, basically. Um, I, did the, I put a, a few slides that talk about difficulty when the plan talk about, you know, shutting down a cooling tower in an emergency situation. Well, you can't really shut down a cooling tower. It, it's hard to shut down. Um, one, because if you have a problem, it's because mostly it was operating. It was operating because it's needed to be in operation. So, you know, there's other things than just shutting down system and take them offline, basically, to, to clean or to, um, to test. Um, same thing go with HVAC system. We found that a lot of time when we do inspection that the standalone air conditioning unit for um, computer rooms are not taken into account. So maybe in the any process it needs to be clarified a little bit better. Uh, one of the things that we see really uh, now, and I don't have much data and have not been able to find much data on it, is basically um, non-potable water uh, storage for plant watering and for green walls. Um, a lot of the water for green walls or bio walls they're referred to are recycled water. They cannot be treated because, um, you know, you can't chlorinate because the plants are fragile. And a lot of these plants on these bio walls are not in soil, basically. The roots are exposed. And what we found is that as yeah, so, so you, know, you can't do a lot, but it's, it's bio material. So, and from what I heard, apparently PSPC have put in their procurement requirements for all new buildings that they should contain a bio wall. So, You know, um, one of the things that we've noticed also is in high performance building, they, they are stepping away from a very large uh, water tank, like big boilers tank and so on. And they have these tiny little tanks point of use basically under the sink and so on. There's no way of controlling the temperature and these things. Uh, there's no thermometer or anything to, to, and you have to find them and you have to maintain them. So that's great a difficulty, especially if you have very large office building and so on. And a lot of things we talk about, like sprinklers, what happens to sprinkler system, what happens to hose bib and so on, that's not being really addressed and there doesn't seem to be any data about that either. Um, what I hear from building um, operators and owners is that, well, um, how much does it cost to do all of this? Right? Because there's not a lot of um, cost being addressed in these plants. It's like, 
well, you shall do this and just go ahead and just test. So for example, in emergency mode, uh, PSPC told us that um, they want 12 weeks worth of sampling, culture and qPCR. And um, it costs money to do so. So how long do you keep testing? So if the 12 weeks, is it a 12 weeks clean, no, no, no concentration whatsoever? What happens if you do 12 weeks and in what, within one week of that, you get a hit? Do you do another 12 weeks after that? Like how do you, are you keep testing forever? Basically in terms of how do you clear a system that's been deemed contaminated or have potentially a problem? And the other thing is, can laboratory meet demand? Because I, we know that our laboratories are not able to handle that kind of testing, right? Um, with not only one building, but all the other buildings that, that's going on at the same time. So that's the, um, that's the kind of questions that uh, we have received. Um, there was questions about qPCR. Um, there has public PSPC has encouraged new technology because they know that their requirements are pretty intensive and pretty cost intensive. Um, they have sponsored um, a portable uh, QPCR piece of equipment and um, that did not go well. So basically what it says is what the, the, the QPCR results came back with a lot more contamination than their culture samples. And somehow it made it to the media and somehow, you know, it created a white panic in the city that my goodness, whatever building is contaminated and PSPC is not doing anything. And yeah, so, um, so at this point in time, uh, they tried to stay away from QPCR. They, Sticking to the culture, pretty much. Um, I'm not sure what the status on that, but you know that's that's the latest that I heard from the from that unit in particular. So you know it was a great document when it was first published in 2013, and it's still a good reference document as far as we're concerned. Um, it needs to be normalized even more, uh, and I'm not sure how much. Um, PSPC is keeping track of everything from all the data I've seen. They seem to have data for cooling tower, but not not the other systems that they were recommending um, that testing be done. Um, we found that we are in the second uh, iteration, if you want, of redoing these uh, management plan because 2013, 2018, basically, in most buildings, it's a five years uh, sort of up updating plan. And we find that it gets better because people use the document and they're like, oh no, you know, that location really, that's hard to samples and so on. So um, we did this better, we don't like this and so on. So it's, it's got better with each iteration on how to prepare these risk assessments. Uh, one of the things is we found that despite everything, training for the building operator and for the general, um, if you want the people involved with the maintenance of the building and operation of the building, the training is not there. It's not um, it's not standardized, so it's hard to to make sure that they understand everything at the same in the same way, basically. And it's it's hard to keep simple. Like it's it's not easy to keep a document simple because a water system in a in a in a building is is hard. It's, you know, it's it's. It, where you can sample or how you can sample is really difficult to determine. And I think we, we maybe we need regulation like Germany basically. Okay, all right. That's it for me. Very good, thank you very much. All right, um, does Michelle have a question? Okay, Michelle, you get to go first since I cut you off last. <laughs> sorry, I'll be sorry. Um, yeah, it's just a, a comment. Hi, how are you? Um, it's it um, yeah, for the Quebec regulations. So we had the same concerns on uh, just a few points of clarification regarding the ability of the labs to pick up uh, and, and carry out the analysis. But uh, after a year, everything was basically done and, and there's been no, this is good business. And um, so if you have a 
standard method that's mandatory and specified like it is in the Quebec regs, uh, the labs follow suit and they just get organized to do it. So that part, I think yep. it's been shown in the US as well, can be tackled. Um, a second point that's quite important, um, the Quebec regulations, they target all cooling towers um, and uh, more than the capacity, I forgot exactly, but anything that's significant. So basically, um, it's quite a bit of, of data. They have generated the data, they have not published it. And for a subset, they've done parallel QPCR uh, by the government and um, and culture. I have the data uh, and Emily is pre you know, preparing a table that I will be able to share with the government's approval. So you'll see when we do both um, what, it, what it does. And actually QPCR has <coughs> really been proven to be useful to detect the towers that are going out of compliance before they hit the high numbers by culture. And what was the final one for, yeah, that's the uh, levels are per, um, the levels were, are, are per liter. So they seem high, they are high. They're basically tenfold higher than the European numbers. The low level where you need to look at your tower, the 10,000 that to a million, that's, <coughs> That's that's ten times higher. It's lower than the um, the levels that are tolerated elsewhere. And the reason for these uh, high numbers, I can tell you. I sat on that committee when they wrote that regulation. They freaked out that everybody would be out of compliance, so they put a higher number. And now the numbers are reported when they're they're in compliance, but they are reported when they're lower, and they do serve to find the towers that are at default. We had too many outbreaks last summer in a city um, in Quebec, and they could find the faulty towers within the day and act upon it. So that was my additional info for the cooling tower part. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. Michelle, the two things: the um, the QPC. Uh, Michelle, the QPCR versus culture report is that something that will be available to the committee anytime soon? Yep. Activated my my sound again. Yes, it will probably probably next week. Uh, I was reviewing the, the table earlier, so um, it's okay, not great. published in an official paper or anything, but it's shared by the government, so that could be helpful. That's fine. That'd be great. And um, the investigation of the numbers, the values found in the cooling towers during this outbreak, that's in a report as well. Oops, <laughs> sound back again. No, it's not. And that's that that part they're more um they're more reluctant to share on the numbers. So you're looking for evidence of infectious dose. Now they match the strains, they've done this now three times, uh, but they have not shared publicly the numbers uh in the cooling towers that were found to be the most probable source, Quebec and now those two events in Trois So I, okay. I can ask what I'm not sure they will at this point because there might be some kind of an inquiry of what why the regulations are not strict enough. So they're kind of they're in court right now for the last outbreak. So they're kind of right. touchy about that. Okay, thank you. All right. Other committee. Chuck. Yeah. Um I, I'm really starting to wonder what sort of procedures are in place to do quality control on laboratories being tested the environmental legionella sequence. Yeah. Is there a certification process? From what I understand, um, sorry. From what I understand, um, I think they refer to the elite elite um, okay. certification C D C and then also um, AIHA has a laboratory certification for microbiology. I think it's MLAB or something like that, but um, it's, it's referred to. Yeah. Yeah. One point there, the ELITE program does no qualification. Yeah. 
That's just a present asset. So there's nothing yeah. been yeah. done in terms of line yeah. square yeah. samples yeah. or yeah. anything of that sort? Just in general? Mm -hmm. I mean, as a publication? Well, is there any data on line split sample performance mm -hmm. for laboratory quantification? Did you know? There is one paper. It, it depends out, on the provinces, yeah. Um, well, Santini shows that they spent the samples out yeah. there. Right, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, bigger results. Yeah. Yeah. And they're in the lab. Yes, that's right. I think there's actually some kind of publication related to that. Actually. There's, there's a CDC publication, but yeah, that one has. Issues. But to Michelle's point, we had one occasion where we sent to two separate labs, yeah. Yeah. and at the time they're both CDC elite, uh -huh. yeah. and they had completely diametrically opposed results. Yeah. Okay. That's like John Lee's 2011 study and subsequent ones that he talked about. I think it would be useful for us to get some of the limited data just showing performances of labs in general. Yeah. So now reflect what's here in North America. The the other issue there with the elite labs is that I believe it has been programmed, proficiency testing program has been moved from CDC to the state of Wisconsin. I don't know <coughs> exactly what's going on there, but you might want to find it. They have routinely quantified, by the way, the Wisconsin State, Wisconsin, yeah, the Wisconsin state always, Health Laboratory. They've always quantified. So I don't think the elite lab has changed, but I don't know. Um, Nick. Yeah, just looking at the report on in Appendix C and D, it's, it's talking about the units of, of, in those yep. tables reflected. It's, yep. it's there at C if you per mill. Per mill. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, can, we, can we put that slide up? Because then I saw another one that said per liter on her slide. Yeah, well, I'm just reading the report. It's per mill. Oh, you can hear me. No, sorry. Yeah. If you want me to slide 23 in the presentation, yeah. it says per liter. Well, now it says uh, per mill. Per mill. Well, we need it, it's slide 23 is confusing. I'm, I'm trying to figure out what anyway, slide 23 is. And do we have three components to it, and it's in the main report. It's just a cut and paste in the main report, appendix yep. D. Okay. And you'll see it there for Lisa Neller. It's in CFU per mill and genome copies per mill. Okay. So yeah. that's what we yeah. had. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I had genome copies per mill. Yeah, but then there was a UFC slide that said 10 to the fourth to 10 to the fifth per liter in the presentation. But I, I presume they meant CFUs and it was just reversed. I don't know what UFC is. I think it's, yeah, I think it's, it's CFUs. 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 Yeah. CFUs, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, Sorry, let me just pull out. Wait, it's it's, it's CFUs in French. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I oh, thought. Yes. I thought it was CFUs. Yeah. I just yeah. sorry. Yeah. Uh, 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 uh. That's not the Legion. Only. No, that's not the one. That's okay. There, that's a Go to the next slide. There are three levels. There's this slide. Yeah. Yes. With that four. And then there's culture by the Legionella standard method, which is a CFU per mil, and then there's QPCR. Sorry. Why is it not? As you see, it's per mil. Yeah. Per mil. So yeah, yeah. Guys, per you mil. can look at the, the table from the guidance is in the um, May presentation that we did together. Yeah. And I think those are, since they're copied, there's no confusion there. They're on slide, uh, yeah. slide, 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 slide. Yes, it's you if you per mil. That we're in there. Actually, I took the, yeah, yeah. because it, they're all like uh, the text from, Slide six of the presentation in May shows the numbers out of the directly out of the guidance. Yeah. Yeah. So there are so the thousand is per C and Q. It's per mil. Per mil. Per mil. Per mil. Yeah. Per, so, but 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 you've got. Um, per mil. Right. I can understand the dip dip slide because that's probably the limit of detection. Yeah. But um, then you've got when a QPCR yeah. test results indicate. GEs, I presume that's Genome genetic equivalent. equivalence, mm -hmm. okay. That's 100, that's Genome 10 unit. of the cube. Yeah. Mil. And then the QPCR says yeah. this is a very 10 CFE per mil. I don't think we should, we yeah. shouldn't go over it too much. <coughs> yeah. But then there was another slide that said, report, it's in the report per yeah. yeah. this, this is not clear. I don't yeah. think we should concentrate yeah. over it. Yeah, I just wanted yeah. to try to clarify it. Yeah. No, you did. <laughs> 
just add, add okay. now. <laughs> I think we can go back to this. Okay, some other questions, comments before we take a break? Okay, thank you very much.